right, so we are here at Real Talk with IOTEX. Welcome. I have a uh, question for you, Charvel, which is, I want to know your origin story. I want, I want you to share that with the community here. Right. Because you mentioned an experience you had, uh, your why, where you realized network connectivity is important and you want to solve a certain problem. Right. And so when a founder feels a pain and solves that pain for others, that's pretty heroic. And I'd love to see what that story is for you. Right. So. Uh, before we start, my name is Charo Tirawi. I'm CEO and founder at Weiru. Thank you so much for having me. Um, this all started in about 2011. I was I was in, I was in school for architecture, and I had to I had to do like a test online, or I had to do something online in that moment. And I, I wasn't at home. I didn't have mobile data in my. I was you know, I was in school. I didn't have any money, so I just went to a cafeteria nearby because they had Wi-Fi, but I had to buy a coffee. I bought the coffee, I got the Wi-Fi password, and it didn't work. So when it didn't work, I got really frustrated, and I said to myself, well, if I have the means, whatever means I had back then, to at least get access to internet every month, what's happening with people that don't have the, mm -hmm. same, uh, the same means that I have in this moment? So I started digging in, and I realized that the United Nations had just declared internet access a human right that same year. So I became obsessed with mm. it. I was at school just writing notes, not paying attention to whatever I was trying. Uh, I had to was. learn in that moment. I was just taking notes for how can I fix this problem? How can I fix this problem? And then I had an idea of building this captive portal. The captive mm. portals were in a thing back then uh, where people just connected to Wi-Fi. They saw this page. Remember that million pic one million pixel page that people bought pixels from oh, yeah. a website? <laughs> yeah. So I thought I can do something similar, maybe not a million pixels because it's too small on the phone, but it could be maybe 12 or, I don't know, 15 slots on the same page. So I tried reaching out to brands. I tried to develop this with a friend and we actually make it work. Um, we didn't make any money on it, so it, it plumped, it didn't work. Uh, it, it worked, but then it didn't work as a company or as a, a successful startup, but that got me started. And I dropped out of, uh, out of um, college mm -hmm. for, well, the University for Architecture in Ecuador. And I just focused 100% mm -hmm. on solving this connectivity problem that I just happened to had one day and I became obsessed with it. It's important to understand that I have been in love with technology like my whole life. like. I, I remember when we got the dial-up internet at home, I was connected every day. I remember the first song I downloaded on <laughs> Napster. It was a Red Hot Chili Peppers song. Um, and yeah, um, um, that's what got me started into this. And then after that, I actually developed a, a Wi-Fi marketing platform that started working good. We partnered with a multinational company, a Chilean company, so I, w I was, um, the regional Wi-Fi marketing director for that company. So I managed teams in about 600, uh, six countries. We connected millions of people, but we weren't solving the problem. These were just people that were going to restaurants and were just being farmed for their information to get Wi-Fi. That's what the businesses were paying for. So then I realized that this wasn't what I really wanted to solve. So I just stepped out of that and I started a company that helped businesses at the bottom of the pyramid to make money by selling Wi-Fi tickets. So what I did, I printed tickets, I brought them to them, and I installed a device that could, could just be accessed by in, inserting one of those tickets. Hmm. So we, I started like that, I, I participated in an accelerator with that startup, and then it died during COVID. Hmm. And during COVID, I realized that it would be a lot, um, a lot easier to try to solve this problem using the centralized technologies, um, especially if we wanted to get people from other countries to do it because I wasn't going to be able to send them the tickets that they had to sell to people. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me started into Wero and how blockchain technology helped me solve what I was trying to solve. At least it helped me put together something that we believe is going to help solve this problem in the next, in the next years. So I want to hear more about that. Why exactly do you need to use Web3 and deep in style incentives to make Wero work? So at first when we started with it was a rewards distribution problem. Mm -hmm. How do I pay these people for the usage, or how do I distribute the acts, the like the tokens for the access to these people that we're going to either use the network or sell access to the network? 
So blockchain, of course, solved this uh, very easily for us because we could identify a specific provider and just pay them using a token. So this uh, open and decentralized um, focus that blockchain has is what got me started with where uh, after I closed uh, my previous company, I started writing the, the white paper for, for where it was not just like it's today. Of course, it has evolved a lot, but the idea behind it was to allow people to invest in deploying internet infrastructures because the mm. other side of the problem was the capex problem mm. how do we solve a capex problem because sharing connectivity was not the only it wasn't going to solve the whole problem sure. because you need to have connectivity to, sh to share connectivity so mm. there's already connectivity in that place what happens with people that have absolutely no connectivity so blockchain um gave me the idea of, okay, we can probably decentralize the CAPEX problem. Mm -hmm. People can invest from wherever they are and we take charge in building a network. And that's what we did. We built our first network in a very low income community in Ecuador. It's called Monte Sinai. It's one of like the most uh, vulnerable, poor and dangerous neighborhoods mm -hmm. in Ecuador. Mm -hmm. It's something you could call it like a favela mm -hmm. in Ecuador, something like this. And we got some help from a foundation that has been working with people in this area and with the municipality. So they helped us with trucks so that we can go there and make the installations. Mm -hmm. So it was it would be safer, safer wow. for us. And um, at the beginning, I didn't t tell anybody that this was going to be on top of blockchain. My network the, uh, or whoever I could reach out to was not into blockchain at that moment. So I had to... What, what year was that? Sorry. Um, 2021. Okay. 2021. So I, I actually had to explain to them in a different way. Like I said, we are going to divide. Let's say it, that's why when when we started, we started with the name Airblocks, not for the company, but for the product, mm. because I tried to sell them the idea that you were going to own a piece of whatever connections happening in a block of air in an area because mm. it was going to be wireless. Right. That's right. when uh, we have some NFTs that are called Airblocks today, and people can get them, tie them to their to their hotspot to earn more rewards. But we can talk that, about that later. And that's how I got started. I got people investing without them knowing they were investing in crypto yet. Um, it was like like pre-sales at the beginning, so we could build this specific network. We did build that network. We then went out and raised uh, our previous round, and then we just started building uh, from then. So. I think a lot of people here in the U.S. don't understand necessarily the degree of the problem that mm. you're solving, especially in LATAM. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the state of connectivity in LATAM and how you're working to improve that? Okay, so let's talk about the state of connectivity globally first. Okay, okay. so there's about over a little bit over 4 billion internet users. That means there's over 3 billion people with no connectivity today. That's a lot, even though 13 years ago, the UN declared internet access a human right, as I told you before. There are 1.5 billion people living in a condition called internet poverty. That means they cannot access a gigabyte of data a month at at least 10 megabits of speed, spending less than 20 cents a day. And that's a lot of people that cannot get access to internet. Just in Latin America, 400 million people lack connectivity. That's about 80 million homes in Latin America with no reliable broadband connectivity to study, to work, to enjoy watching movies, whatever you want to do with internet access. This is a, an amazing library of information that a lot of people cannot get access to. So that is what motivates me to bring all the opportunities that I had because I had internet. I couldn't be here today if I didn't have internet access so that I could read. I didn't go to school for telecom. When I uh, when I dropped out of college from for architecture, I just taught myself how to make this work. And I could do that because I had internet access. So there's a lot of kids today that are probably, I don't know, the next Einstein that has no internet access. So this will level the opportunities to, for everybody. Mm. So let's talk about where Weibo is right now. So in terms of your adoption, the scale of usage in LATAM. Okay. So 
Today, Weiru has a proprietary firmware called Genesis Device. We sold out of our first batch. Nice. We have been focusing on firmware so that people can get off-the-shelf devices and turn them into Weiru hotspots easily at home without having to go through us, solving the supply chain problem that others could have there. Um, we partnered with the United Nations. So we, this partnership was to deploy um, networks in low-income community areas for refugees in Ecuador. So this partnership had about um, 60,000 monthly active users consuming a whooping 1 million gigabytes of data just last year. So the idea was that they would invest in the in the first infrastructure and this will become self-sustainable in four years and it's already over 60% self-sustainable in the first year. So we expect for it to be self-sustainable after year two. So year three is gonna be paying for itself and these people will continue to get connectivity for free because they're not paying anything right now. And the idea is that right, we just added some features for them to be able to connect every single one of them of their devices to the to the network that they have, and they will have they could manage just one single account to top that account or watch ads because they can access for free by watching ads. So that's been also interesting. We're expanding on that. We are probably tripling down on the coverage in the next months. Um, we have also gotten a, um, a municipality in Latin America to sign an internet letter with us to monetize their 9,000 Wi-Fi hotspots. Not just that, but to bring sponsors, like corporate sponsors, to deploy more of those community networks that I just mentioned before. And several other things that we can get from them, like connections to other municipalities or to other organizations similar to the United Nations, because once even a small local government um, trusts, a, a, I don't know, a startup or a company and whatever they're doing is successful, I start turning to you and then people start, hey, maybe we can try this, maybe we can try that because connectivity is so important and I guess like politicians have in Latin America now know that people need to be online for them to be able to reach to them even if they want it. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that's where we are. We also have our mobile app in the stores, iOS and Android which is very interesting because this puts the pins, uh, the pin in everyone's hands without having to invest in any device. True. So people can download the app, they can share their known Wi-Fi at home or their, from their favorite, favorite restaurant, they can validate existing networks to earn tokens, and they can, of course, uh, invite their friends to join as well. People can also onboard their hotspots directly from the mobile app. And so far, we have uh, over 10 million networks that have been mapped by the community and about 100 million um, Weiru tokens waiting to be redeemed when TGE happens later on this year from this early community of operators, early validators and users. And yeah, that's that's where we are today. What I admire about you is that you have been in field that you don't just solve problems in the ivory tower and code your way out of issues. And I love that you bring your company and partners into places that really need you and you empathize. So that's highly unique to me. Um, but the fact is, this journey must have been very hard. Only recently are you the entrepreneur that everybody wants to call up, right? Recently, you're the hot girl in the room. And um, we can talk about all these great metrics and your UN partnerships and so many things, but I'd love to, I'd love to know what kind of lessons you would share with others who are in your shoes as of three, four years ago, right? Five years right. ago. How would you tell them to navigate this, this incredible difficulty right. of solving a problem close to your heart, close to your home, and doing it really for the people that need it, right. keeping your feet on the ground, but also attacking with the power of technology that is of the future? Right. So first of all, you have to surround yourself with people that understand the problem the same way as you do, so they can be as focused as you are as a founder or as an entrepreneur. And that's the first thing, because if people, if your co-founders or people working in your team don't trust what the company is doing or are not as passionate uh, about the problem as the founders are, it's probably not gonna work in the long term. They're just gonna leave whenever they can. And mm -hmm. that's one thing. But the most important thing is something you mentioned, is you have to solve a problem because there's a lot of companies that have amazing products, but they are not applying it to solve real 
problems in the places that mattered most, okay. right? So it's been very hard. Uh, I remember when we just started, it was very hard not to be compared to previous startups or companies that did uh, or are doing not the same, but similar things using blockchain. And it was hard to, uh, to make investors understand last cycle that dipping was going to be what, it, what was going to move dipping in real world assets was going to move blockchain forward and make it uh, the norm for everybody uh, around the world. So it's it was very hard even before I started uh, on blockchain. It was even harder being from Latin America, not having the best pronunciation in English. It's actually a barrier. Mm -hmm. It's actually a barrier that gets investors not interested in you as much as Ivy League yeah. founders, and that, that and that's real mm -hmm. because. I saw it firsthand. I had great product, a, a, a great product, and other founders had similar products. And I wasn't born here mm -hmm. in the United States. I mm -hmm. I didn't go to Harvard mm -hmm. or Stanford, right? Mm -hmm. So it was very hard. It was very hard to get people to to take us seriously at the beginning. I think that uh, a main catalyst was when I decided to build this on blockchain, because. Everybody in blockchain is has an an, an entrepreneurial mind mm -hmm. because we're all in something that nobody's pretty sh like really sure where this is heading mm -hmm. in the next fifty years. Yeah. Like nobody knows the out outcome. We just know that this could really change the world for good in so many sectors, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, keep grinding. Um, you have to trust yourself. You have to you have to build confidence, and you have to build. And you have to build you as a confident person that you can defend what you, what you are doing against everybody. But at the same time, you have to be coachable, right? Because you do need people that know more than you to help you out. Mm -hmm. You never know more than anybody else. That's not, if you are the smartest person in the room, you should leave that room and go to another room right. so you can continue learning. <laughs> so I love that. And we're really excited to have you in the Deep and Surf Cohort 1. Thank you so much. Uh, we'd Absolutely. love to hear what you're hoping to get out of the program and in terms of integration with IOTEX, how you're hoping to integrate with the ecosystem. Right. So we are going to uh, release uh, or launch Weru natively on IOTEX. Everything that we have built so far is going to be running. It's already in progress of running on IOTEX. Um, out of the accelerator, what we most want to get is advisors, mm -hmm. good advisors that, as I just told you, that can help us make what we are doing better and move forward. Of course, we want to raise our next private token round and we will get as much visibility as possible being part of this accelerator and get more visibility with the community so that the community knows that uh, a company or a project like IOTEX is supporting Weru is important for us because that gives us more credibility with people. All right, one last question for you. Yeah. So let's look five years into the future. Let's say Weru is maximally successful. What does the world look like? What does Weru look like? I don't think we could be like at our max in five years. The problem is so big yeah. that it's not gonna take five years to connect everybody. But I do see uh, close to 10 million hotspots being deployed and run by the community um, or by partners like the United Nations mm -hmm. or ISPs that I am talking right now with municipalities, uh, international uh, agencies or organizations that are nonprofit and of course internet service providers, especially the small guys because they need a new weapon to be able to participate in this global market against the giants that manage most of the telecom sector. So, yeah, probably being the largest telecommunications deep in Latin America, connecting as many families that don't have connectivity today. That's my main focus. Connect the unconnected in Latam and then the world. Jordel, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. Glad to be here.